Hey, hey, what's happening? Billy Carson here, a.k.a. Forbidden Knowledge. Let me hit you with the four. Don't forget the four. No, it's not a gang sign. I heard people asking me if it's a in comments, if it's some kind of Mason symbol. No, it's four. One, two, three, four. Very simple. Four fingers, forbidden knowledge. You know what I'm saying? And it's catching on. So hit him with the four. All right. You'll see me in photos and videos and everything else. Forbidden knowledge. All right. Welcome, welcome to the show tonight. I'm glad to be back on here with this live broadcast. Looking forward to sharing some knowledge with you. It's going to be a great, great show. Um, looking forward to talking about the forbidden black Jews of Ethiopia. And uh, that's going to be the topic tonight. Uh, it's going to talk about the black history of the Jewry, uh, where they came from, how they spread around the world. And some of my own theories as well, based on my research. And this is going to be a very educational video. I'm not going to go off on any emotional tangents or anything like that. I'm just going to give you guys the facts. And then you take those facts and you meditate on them and you run with them and you research them and do whatever you do with them. Spread that information around. Because, you know, throughout my research, what I found was that a lot of people don't even know that black Jews exist. And so it's time to bring forward the information about the ancestry of the black Jews and how far back does it go? Uh, and how come they've been forbidden? How come they've been separated and cut off? So we're gonna talk about that tonight, all right? It's gonna be a great, great night. Looking forward to it. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna use a PowerPoint tonight. And the reason why I'm gonna use a PowerPoint is because not because I don't know my facts, is because I want to make sure that these platforms see my facts so they don't delete this video because you can't delete truth. You see, the problem with a lot of people that start talking about these topics in Hollywood and in sports and in everything else, uh, athletes, they don't know how to articulate themselves. And there's nothing against them. I love them. But the problem that they have when they run into these situations, music artists, you know who I'm talking about. They don't know, to, know how to articulate themselves and they don't know how to come with the receipts. Well, I'm going to be their ambassador tonight because I'm coming with the receipts. <laughs> and when I put the receipts down, nobody can take down what I've said. And I'm not going to be apologizing to anyone because I'm not going to insult anyone. I'm going to educate people. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to educate. All right. So that's what we're doing tonight, all right? So let's take a look at what we're talking about. Now, first and foremost, we're talking about Black people. Uh, black people have been on this planet for hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions. If you look into uh, the history of this planet, you'll find that there, you'll, you'll dig up the bodies of Black people everywhere on every single continent, every single continent. When you go deep into the real ancient texts, I'm talking about super, super deep antiquity, you discover that black people were trading from Africa all the way as far as Mexico. We call it Mexico now, but back then it was Mesoamerica, right? Trading with the Mayans, even marrying with some of the Mayans uh, and then, you know, establishing a whole other culture in that area. Those are the Teotihuacans. That's a whole other video I'm going to talk about, talking about the Olmecs. And then you discover you look into Asia, Eurasia, Malaysia, Melanesia, China, Japan. I don't care where you go on this planet. You're going to find out we were there. <laughs> uh, and so it's pretty interesting. And yes, slavery uh, did exist. Some people don't think slavery slavery did exist. People were sold as slaves. There was a huge slave uh, trade going on, uh, you know, for a very long time. Uh, however, not all of the people that were already in some of those lands were were brought here via a boat. There were people here, people there, people in other places, people in the Caribbean, all over the place. Uh, so you know the the concept in the mind that all black people originate in Africa and then were taken out of Africa on slave ships is a huge, huge misconception. Okay. Huge misconception. 
the most advanced civilization was in the land of Kem long before that area was called Egypt. Egypt is a new name. It's, an, it's a brand new name. It just arrived here. The land of Kem, where we get chemistry and alchemy from, uh, and comedics, that comes from uh, the land of Kem. And the original inhabitants of the land of Kem were the Dogon tribe. Uh, and the Dogons now, who are in Mali, Africa, they moved in, or they literally migrated up to Mali after a, a coup or takeover. Uh, an outside nation came in, saw that, hey, these Egyptians, man, these people are living over here. These comedic people are living over here with no, no, no police, no military. They're loving life. They're in a golden age. Uh, everything is beautiful. They're doing arts and crafts and singing and dancing and, and, and studying and researching the stars. And so somebody came and saw that. And the only weakness that we had was that we were at peace and, and one with nature and with each other, which with each other, and they took us over. Egypt has been overthrown seven times. So for the people that are always, you know, saying, you know, every Egypt is always black. Actually, Egypt was not always black. It was not, I'm gonna say that again. Egypt was not always black. Egypt was always not in the golden age. You have to understand that as well. There have been some brutal, brutal rulers come through the land of Kem, up through the land of Egypt, uh, which is what it's called right now, uh, up into our modern, modern day. So the dynastic era had some real, real tyrants that ruled for periods of time. And it changed hands quite a few times along the way. Uh, you know, so, but that's a whole other topic, a whole other podcast. But the point I'm making here is, the original inhabitants of, of the land of Kem, pre-dynastic uh, dynasty, pre-dynastic Egypt, were the Dogon tribe. All right. Pretty interesting stuff. But we're going to get into this tonight. I see everybody jumping into the uh, jumping on the video. Make sure you please share this video. Please cl click the like button. Helps the algorithm get going so more people can see this video. Click that bell if you're on YouTube so you can get notifications. And if you aren't getting the notifications, which I know a lot of you aren't, you can text me at 954-245-0086. You can see the number at the bottom of the screen. As a matter of fact, if you text hashtag Black Knight, you'll automatically be added to my YouTube or my any anytime I go live list. But also you have a chance to win an autographed movie poster. The original first edition movie poster that I made before I even filmed the Black Knight satellite. So prior to actually filming The Black Knight, I made this poster. This poster was made two and a half years ago. And there's a picture of me standing next to King Simon. He came to visit me at my new house at that time uh, in uh, Florida. And he took a picture standing right next to my movie poster long before, that was two years ago, long before the movie was even filmed, before I even started filming it. And the reason why I did that manifestation i understand the, the power of manifestation I, I understand the power of creating your own reality so i knew this was something i wanted to do at a high level and i made the movie poster this original poster i'll be signing the back autographing it and shipping it out to somebody some lucky person no uh no no taxes no postage uh and all we ask is that you take a picture with it and let us put it up on forbidden giveaways on instagram the forbidden giveaways instagram account where we give away cars and money and computers and all kind of stuff, all right? So again, text hashtag Black Knight. All right, you see at the bottom of the screen, hashtag Black Knight with two Ks, B-L-A-C-K-K-N-I-G-H-T to 954-245-0086. And uh, you're going to have a great time here. And let me switch this up here real quick. Let me see. Boom. boom. And here. Okay, one second. Edit. That one won't work here, so let me put this one in. All right. One, two, four, five, zero, zero, eight, six. And we're going to get this party started. All right. One, four, two, four, five, zero, zero, eight, six. It's putting this in the chats for everybody so that everybody can get a chance, no matter where you are, to get the opportunity to take part in this. And let me just cut and paste this. Save it. So, okay. All right, cool. Now, I'm going to drop this in the chat. There right, you go. Boom. 
All right, guys. Now you got a chance. Text that in. Everybody should see that. And also in the comments, if you're on another account like Facebook, I think I'm on Twitter. Wherever you see me live at, you guys can do it down, okay? All right. So let's get into this, guys. Let's get into this. Let's get into the forbidden black Jews of Ethiopia. All right. Now. These are actual black rabbis. These are black rabbis in Ethiopia. I'm so really sad about that global sickness that happened in 2020 because I was supposed to head down to Ethiopia because I was going to do a documentary or start filming for the documentary I was going to build on the um, the Lalibela temples there and also, of course, the black Jews. Unfortunately, the sickness swept the land and delayed that and delayed that and delayed that. Uh, finally, it's come back time again. So I'm looking forward to maybe 2024. 2023 is fully booked. Half of 2024 is already booked for me. But I'm looking forward to 2024 to go there and document what I was going to do, which was to go face to face, sit with the, go to the to the synagogue, temple where they worship, uh, speak directly with the, um, the homegrown original black Jews, as well as uh, document the Lalibela temple and the technology used to build that temple and carve it out of solid mountain. And then also I was going to travel over to India to document the Kailash temple, which is built the same exact way using the same exact technique. And of course, I've already been to Abu Simbel, which is also built the same way using the same exact technique. All three temples are, are um, uh, linked in that they have the same master architect and the same exact tooling technology and the same exact tool marks. So I'm looking forward to... Um, to doing that but that'll be 2024 before i can get there in person all right so anyway here we go guys we're talking about the black jews of ethiopia and like i said this is going to be a very educational piece and i'm going to start first off here with my sources because that's very very important all right very very important to start with the sources uh and the sources come in the beginning just like I do some of my big lectures and workshops, I bring the sources in the beginning. So CN, and, uh, CNEWA.org, uh, ConsciousItems.com, FrontierSin.org, MyJewishLearning.com, Britannica.com, good old uh, encyclopedia there, Britannica, Safaria.org, JewishVoice.org, JewishVirtualLibrary.org, of course, Wikipedia for just some uh, uh, information on a, uh, a cabinet member that we have to talk about at the end. BBC News, the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation from the Sumerians, the Epic of, of, uh, of Atrahasis, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, the Myth of Adapa, and the 42 Ideals of Mayat. Okay, so those are the sources. Now, let me pull back out of here for a minute. All right. Yeah, just checking on the chat, see how you guys are doing here. Looks like everyone is in there and every, everybody's vibing. All right, cool. That's what I like to see, guys. That's what I like to see. First, let's talk about um, where they're located, all right? In the mountains of Ethiopia is a group of Ethiopians that have celebrated their Jewish heritage for centuries. Actually, it's been about 15 to 1800 years, all right? 15 to 1800 years. Uh, now that's not when they started, that's just when they started in that area because they migrated, which we'll talk about in a little bit, all right? All Jews have been migrating. They've been migrating literally nonstop since, since uh, about maybe 2000 years ago, all right? Around the time of Moses. Uh, and so, uh, uh, actually, I'm um, sorry, 4,000 years ago, 4,000 years, not 2,000, 4,000 years ago. And so Ethiopian Jews living in a remote mountainous region of northwestern Ethiopia, which is an area which until recently could be reached only on foot or on horseback. So this is a, a key clue to why hardly anybody knows about these people. OK, until recently, you have to go on this like journey. You know, like this real rural journey to get to these people. You have to go for like an Australian uh, Aboriginal call it a walkabout 
uh, to get very difficult to get to them. All right. Black Jews who call themselves the Kyla or the Beta Israel. The house of Israel is really what it means. OK, they observe the Sabbath as indicated in the Torah. They eat only kosher food. They pray in straw roofed synagogues and they use only unleavened bread during the seven days of Passover. Yet they also offer animals and sacrifice and have priests and deacons appointed by the community and their neighbors call them Falashas, which means strangers, wanderers or exiles. All right. So they follow, as you can see, the majority of the the jewelry, the rules of being a, an Orthodox Jew. However, they don't have the Talmud. Now, that's really important because the Talmud came way later, which to me proves that the other Jews that are reading from the Talmud um, are most likely the Talmud was something that was written and added much, uh, much later. Uh, and then when the uh, Ethiopian Jews migrated down to where they are in Ethiopia out of Egypt, they were cut off from getting access to that Talmud information and never had a chance to learn the Talmud. But everything else that they do is pretty much the same, to be quite honest with you, Just proving that they are they are actual authentic Jews, which has now been authenticated by Israelis. These are some pictures of some Ethiopian Jews right here. All right. You can see the uh, Star of David behind them. Here's another uh, Beta Israel Jewish family. It looks like they're on a bus, probably on their way to um, somewhere. But uh, you can see that they're all together here uh, looking, you know, pretty modern. This is a modern day thing. These people are well known. These Jews are well known. Uh, and they travel around and just have regular lives just like everyone else. And just accept that they're they're from Ethiopia. So these are chief rabbis of both the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic Jews recognize the indigenous Ethiopians as members of the Agnau ethnic group as authentic Jews. So they have been recognized as authentic Jews by chief rabbis of both the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic Jews. All right. Sephardic Jews uh, primarily hail from uh, Turkey and that region, uh, Iraq, uh, Ashkenazi, more European. Uh, and, you know, the thing about this whole thing really is I just based on my research, it looks like a lot of the information was taken directly out of Egypt, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, really soon, actually. But it just seems like a lot of the information was taken out of Egypt. Well, these, the tribes formed and then moved uh, through, a, through Egypt and then spreading from there. So, of course, you know, the biblical narrative of, of, uh, of Jews as slaves building pyramids just didn't happen, guys. I'm sorry, just didn't happen. Um, when you really go to Egypt, like I've been many times, you find out that there were no Jews there working, uh, doing hard labor as slaves and building these things because the records have been left behind by the construction uh, people who worked on these sites. And you find out that they had payment. They were paid a salary every single week. They had uh, a form of health insurance in ancient times. And you can see the records of people claiming for like broken legs and broken arms and injuries and and, and and injured backs. All these records are available to the general public and are well documented and they really do exist. Uh, there's another story that really tells the truth about how people came together, formed a monotheistic religion and then fled from Egypt, which I'm gonna get into tonight, all right? But these are the three races, as you can tell them apart by this. I saw somebody in the chat, how can you tell them apart? You have the uh, Agnau ethnic group, which is the Ethiopian Jews, the Sephardic Jews are also out of Turkey, but also some in um, uh, Spain and even into Asia as well. All right. And then you have the Ashkenazi Jews. Ethiopian Jews origins can be traced to the exodus from Egypt, a band of Hebrews headed south rather than across the Sinai Desert, ending up in Ethiopia. Uh, so in the land of Moses. Now, we're going to get into this Moses story a little bit, and here's where I'm going to give you some of my own uh, conjecture 
some of my own hypothesis as to what I believe happened uh, with the Moses story, because uh, the actual person, Moses, uh, I believe is actually Pharaoh Akhenaten, a former Pharaoh Akhenaten, who was actually ousted out of Egypt and took followers with him. All right. Moses was quite possibly outcasted, the outcasted Pharaoh Akhenaten. Numbers 12, 1 in the King James Bible. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. woman. And so, you know, um, basically Moses, um, you know, he, he, he left out of Egypt. And I'm going to tell you, I think, in my opinion, it was actually Pharaoh Akhenaten is actually Moses. I mean, we all know that the name Moses didn't really exist back then. That's a that's a made up name. Obviously, there's no Paul, Peter and and, and all these kind of names. I mean, come on, wake up. Those names are all fabricated names. However, there are people associated to those names. But but the uh, the actual names are are something else. I mean, there's nobody in, in Middle East called Mary. OK, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. All right. However, uh, Akhenaten is an interesting character in ancient Egypt in that he actually decided to start following Amun-Ra, a.k.a. Marduk, who can be found in the Torah, the Jewish American Virtual Library, and everywhere else in the Bible, right? And so Marduk is Amun-Ra, and Amun-Ra is a jealous god. And there'll be no other gods but him that made it into the actual Bible, hit that text that he said there. He was also known as Aten, the sun disc, because he, instead of walking amongst men on the ground, he liked to rule from the sky in his ship. And then Akhenaten called it the sun disc. Okay. And anyway, at any rate, uh, Akhenaten was now convinced that this was the one God that he was going to worship and under the rule and under the um, under the guidance of this Anunnaki named Marduk, a.k.a. Amun-Ra, he was going to usher in monotheism to the world through Pharaoh Akhenaten because he wanted everybody to think that he was the one and only true God that existed and to forget all of his relatives because you had Yahweh, who was also known as Enlil, you had uh, Ia Enki, who, who was uh, another one of the gods. You had Anu, who was the head god. You had all these gods walking around on earth in different places on the planet at any given time. Uh, and this guy, Marduk, who was actually related to them, became very jealous, according to the Sumerian tablets, and wanted to be the only one getting worshipped. He wanted to be the king of the planet so bad, he started a war to take over kingship before his anointed time which he did. Okay. So this is a brutal guy. This guy's actually crazy. All right. In my personal opinion, and I'm getting this information directly from Sumerian tablets. Now, what's interesting here is when we go a little bit deeper into Pharaoh Akhenaten's family line, all right, you see the King Tut statue here, this black statue up in the upper left, this King Tut statue from the Cairo Museum. He's holding his staff. Okay, he was the son of Akhenaten, and uh, his stepmother was Nefertiti, down here at the bottom, right? And then his uh, grandfather, right here, Amenhotep III, right? And then to the right of him is Queen Taye, that was his wife, so that was King Tut's grandmother, but also Akhenaten's mother. So Akhenaten's mother is beneath him, and beneath Akhenaten here is Amenhotep III, Okay, and then uh, to over here is his wife Nefertiti, all right, and and his son King Tut. Now, what's interesting, what started happening with uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten is he literally started to um, do something crazy. All right, I'm going to zoom out of this for a second because I need to talk to you guys about this for a minute. Um, he started to do something a little bit crazy, so. Pharaoh Akhenaten, once he got these orders directly from Amun-Ra, he then was told to go around and begin to deface all the other gods. He was then making rules that if anybody were to worship another god other than the sun disk, Amun-Ra, Aten, that uh, they would be murdered, killed. And so he started getting this huge following of people pretty quickly 
that were underneath his wings. In other words, he was like uh, the priest and they were his, uh, you know, they were his congregation. <laughs> and he was preaching this monotheistic concept where he was ushering in a one God religion to, uh, to the area. And he was having people go around and chip away at the faces and the bodies and the noses and everything else of all the statues around Egypt that represent any other God. That's where it really came from. So if you're wondering why the noses and the heads and the, and the ears are chipped off all the time, it's not because white people went to Egypt and did this because they weren't even around in ancient times. These things can be dated back to the time when these things were defaced. They were defaced. The majority of them were defaced long before the Greeks and the Romans ever even showed up. These are just facts, guys. I'm here to give you real facts. I'm not here to play, play with your heartstrings. I'm not here to pimp your brain and make you feel good inside. I'm here to give you the information. Whether you like it or not, I'm giving you all the information, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The reason why those noses and those ears are missing is actually two reasons. One reason is, the first reason is because the ears and the noses are very, very difficult to maintain over thousands of years or hundreds of years even because those are the most brittle parts of the statue. And they usually uh, fall away or, or uh, uh, you know, degrade first, okay? Especially when they've been buried and tossed over and everything else. The second reason is because Pharaoh Akhenaten ordered that these things be chipped away, broken, and pretty much erased. So when you go to Egypt with me, whoever went, the people who are in this chat right now who went with me just a few weeks ago, they saw it with their own eyes. We know this stuff was done in ancient times, uh, long before anybody white even arrived. So uh, he, 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 the people around him were like, this guy's erasing our history. Like, we have to stop him at any cost. Finally, he was ousted. Okay, he was ousted. Um, and so, but what did he do? He didn't just leave. He left with his band of new followers. And what were they studying from? They were creating the what, what is now known as the Old Testament, but all that information wasn't written yet. It came from Sumerian tablets. The bulk of the Old Testament is coming from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, the Epic of Atrahasis, okay? A lot of that is the, um, uh, and of course, several cylinder scrolls from the Sumerians. A lot of that is the majority of the Old Testament, the Epic of Gilgamesh. That's the true story of Noah and Noah's Ark. A lot of it, and the myth of Adapa. Uh, all this is coming from Sumerian Tablets and the Egyptian Book of the Dead, all right? They were taking that information back then at that time, because remember, there was nothing yet. And they're turning it into written text under one canonized type text to study and research. And then they fled out of Egypt and left. All right. Left out of Egypt. And then they spread out all over the place. This is Queen Taye. This is uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten's mother. Okay, this is his mother. This is a re-rendering of what she looked like. Uh, people who went with me saw the actual uh, mummy at the actual museum. We went to the Museum of Civilization. You can see this is a black and white image here at the bottom. And you can see that she was a, a black woman with uh, woolly hair, just like you see here, like regular tight curls like all black people have. You can see this head bust above in the upper right corner. That's at the Egyptian Museum depicting her true likeness at the time that it was taken. You can see that she's older. Her face is drawn down a little bit. Her mouth is drawn down. She was obviously an older woman at the time, a grandmother. Most likely, well, she never got to be really a grandmother, but older woman at the time. You know, King Tut was, um, well, we don't know. Maybe Pharaoh Akhenaten's daughters may have had some children. She may not have never seen them, but, uh, but, but King Tut was killed, and so was his girlfriend. However, um, you can see here she definitely was a black woman, all right? She was um, a queen of Egypt in the 18th dynasty, wife of the pharaoh, Amenhotep III, mother of Akhenaten, grandmother of both Tutankhamun and Ashkenam uh, Senam, Senamun, I'm sorry, Ankh Senamun, my bad. And she exerted enormous influence at the courts of both her husband and son and is known to have communicated directly with the rulers of foreign nations. She was like an emissary. Uh, ambassador. Uh, the, Arna, the Amarna 
letters also show that she was highly regarded by these rulers. So these are the Amarna letters, which are available, public record. This is proof of more evidence that these people existed, okay? And especially during the reign of her son, although she believed in the traditional polytheistic religion of Egypt. See, her son wanted to bring in monotheism. She believed in the multiple gods. He believed in the single god. She supported Akhenaten's monotheistic reforms, most likely because she recognized them as important political stratagems to increase the power of the throne at the expense of the priesthood of Amun. So basically, like I said, guys, <laughs> this is... Uh, this is, what, this is what was going on back then. This was a, a battle between religions. Is it going to be multiple gods like the Greeks believed in? The Greeks took that from Egypt and created, created the pantheon. The original pantheon came even before Egypt or Chem. It came out of Iraq, out of Mesopotamia, the Sumerian pantheon. Those people who were in the Sumerian pantheon, their names got changed twice. Once into Kemetic and Egyptian names, and then the second time it was into Greek. Actually, three times. The third was in the Roman. All right. Now, what was so special about it? what does this Akhenaten have to do? Why am I rambling so much when I'm supposed to be talking about black Jews? Well, you see me here inside the king's chamber inside of the Great Pyramid. I'm in the king's chamber. In the king's chamber, you see this stone box in front of me. This granite box is not a sarcophagus. This granite box is part of the technology of the inner workings of the Great Pyramid. And this, stone, this granite box has a giant chunk missing out of this corner facing the screen, the front of the screen here. That giant chunk of granite flew off and flew across the room and struck the other granite on the wall about 20 feet away and, and left an indention of its exact shape in that wall. What did that? A high energetic explosion because in here, this is where fusion uh, reaction happened. This is where the power was stepped up and then burst through through the top, through the apex of the Great Pyramid. But it all really was, uh, the energy burst was created here. And what did it hold? It held the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is a real piece of technology. Uh, scientists at, at universities and other engineers have recreated the Ark of the Covenant based on simple instructions that are actually inside the Bible and created something that was drawing so much power. It's like a giant capacitor. The university had to shut it down because it was pulling all the power out of the local area. Uh, and the engineers had to even shut it down because it was over. It was just too much power. It's getting ready to, to, uh, to create a, a major power outage, just how much power this thing was able to generate. From basic, simple instructions they create. You can look those up, those videos up on YouTube. They actually exist. Right. And so the box I'm standing in front of, this sits inside of it. It's the exact same dimensions. Why would they put this inside of it? Well, the reason why this box was added to the pyramid long after it was already built is because part of the pyramid technology had broken. The pyramid used to have water running underneath it from the Nile. The Nile used to run right up close to the Great Pyramid. Over time, well, for one reason, because of a war that happened, the pyramid, the second pyramid war, and then a dam was built. Two reasons why the Nile shifted away from that area and left it dry and barren. But the tubules that go underneath the pyramid where the water would flow from the aquifer is still there because you can actually walk inside of them when you go around and underneath the pyramid. I know because I've been there. Now, what's interesting about this, when water would flow under the magnetized granite base of the pyramid in the aquifer, it would, it would create something called physiostatic electricity. And this physiostatic electricity will pull ions up into the pyramid and then shoot them up through the grand gallery which had resonating rods, which have now been removed, but we can see the slots where they were. Then it would be shoved into the king's chamber where I'm standing, and some type of fusion would, reaction would happen, and that would be the power burst that would then get sent through the apex with the gold capstone and then transmitted out wireless electricity to the region, and the crystal granite magnetized obelisk would capture that ambient energy. And if you had a jed pillar, which is like a Tesla coil, with a cable connected to it, which we've seen in Egypt when I took people to the underground crypt at Dendera, you can then power things like light bulbs, electroplating devices, and so forth and so on. Okay? Powerful stuff. Now, the reason why I'm saying all this is because when Akhenaten was kicked out of Egypt, he took this with him. He went into the Great Pyramid and snatched it and took it with his followers into the desert. Okay? This is why I believe that he's really the true Moses of the Bible. Uh, he's the one that actually fled with the people. 
uh, that became known as the Jews, the black Jews. Because why? Moses went down into Ethiopia, became known as the land of Moses. So the word cushy uh, or cush is generally used in the Hebrew Bible to refer to a dark skinned person of African descent. Jewish rabbinical literature uses Kushite to mean black African people in general. Okay. 19th century Christian missionaries found that this group celebrated Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Passover. And they also slaughtered a lamb at Passover and knew that the first five books of the Bible and some of the apocryphal, apocryphal books excluded from the, from the Hebrew uh, scripture by the Ptolemaic rabbis because they have they have basically had doubtful authenticity so they knew about all this and it's hard to imagine how the customs of beta israel could so closely resemble pre-talmudic judaism judaism in palestine if this group's origins were at the time of the exodus so what this means guys is this these black jews existed before the talmud they existed before the torah these were the original jews I believe, in my opinion, that were even possibly followers of this Akhenaten who fled out of Egypt, took the Ark of the Covenant with him, which is why the, the Egyptians had to send the, the, uh, the chariots after them because they realized they took the source of Egypt's power, gone. And without that, they would fall back into darkness. So they went after him to try to get it. Now, when you look at the translations of Moses crossing the Red Sea, if you go back into the root words in the original text, go back into Aramaic, you discover something. They did not cross the Red Sea. That's been a big mistake, I'm going to call it that nicely, by Christian churches and, and synagogues all over the world talking about the Old Testament where Moses crossed the Red Sea. He actually never crossed the Red Sea. He crossed the Sea of Reeds. It's a mistranslation, maybe by accident on purpose. I'm not sure. But he crossed the Sea of Reeds, a much closer and much smaller and easier sea to actually cross. Okay. He took the ark with him, escaped into the desert. And from there, of course, you know the rest of the story. He went to Mount Sinai and uh, went to the top, had a word with God, uh, you know, talked to a burning bush when he came. Now, he was given the Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments come from the 42 laws of Mayotte or the 42 ideals of Mayotte, which I've read multiple times on YouTube and Instagram and everywhere else and TikTok. Those are, that's the origins of the Ten Commandments. So obviously that story has been a little bit remixed. But when he comes down, one of the main commandments in those tablets is do not kill. Right. And as soon as he comes down, he's unhappy with the way his tribes are acting. So he decides to kill. A, kill. I mean, he killed about a few hundred people just then. So. <laughs> He just got the command and he disobeyed the command. I don't know. And he, then he claimed it was God that, uh, you know, under the name of God, I'm going to kill you people because you're screwing up out here. I mean, this religion is, is just, you know, you got to be careful with religion. It can really it can really twist your brain up if you're not really understanding and you're not rooted and grounded properly. If you become fanatical, it can it can really uh, it can really do some damage. So. These Jews come down. They start getting into the desert. You know the story about Moses wandering the desert for 40 years and all this stuff. What really happened was a lot of tribes were lost. People split up and went their separate ways. Some ended up in Germany, Poland, Russia, uh, England, Europe, uh, you know, uh, uh, UK, I'm sorry. Uh, some went into Asia, some went into Africa, and we know the ones in Africa, Ethiopia, right? We know that Moses went down into Ethiopia and married... Um, uh, uh, an Ethiopian woman. And from there, I'm pretty sure, began to pass on all these teachings of the Jewry to these people. And that became a Jewish nation, nation because he brought along with him um, people from, from, the, from Egypt. He then was already down there meeting up with these people. He's married now into this, these Ethiopians. And it becomes a, a new Jewish nation from scratch formed right there with all the original traditions that they had established pre-Talmud in existence already. OK. And just again, looking at Akhenaten, looking at Akhenaten's family, you can see clearly that they're all black. 
and uh, Moses married a black woman. It's very clear. It's very extremely clear in the text that Moses married a black woman. They made sure to say that he married a Cushite, which means black woman. He married a black woman there. And so um, and started a whole, you know, a whole lineage. And it really, in my opinion, is Pharaoh Akhenaten. It just makes the most sense uh, based on what I know historically that has happened in the area. And you won't believe where they are now, right? Did they disappear? Did they assimilate into other societies? Were they persecuted or wiped out? Because of persecution over the centuries in many of the countries in which they now live, many hid their Jewish heritage by practicing their faith in secret. Some are locally known to be Jewish and suffer prejudice and persecution because of it, but they have only recently become known to the rest of the world. In the last 75 years or so, Jewish communities have become known in Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, India, and even in China and other surprising countries. Even more surprising to, uh, to some is that members of the lost tribes living in these countries look like any other people that are native to those regions. So now we're talking about the fact that they've literally spread into so many cultures and embedded themselves in so many cultures and through breeding over and over again, many generations, it's hard to even tell. Now they actually have blended completely in with those, with the people from those regions in those areas. Okay. So they literally have spread around the entire planet and have, um, uh, have, uh, blended in with everyone. All right. A little bit more information that adds evidence to me that the black Jews, cause some people in some videos will try to tell you that the black Jews just, um, you know, they just happened to capture some of this information and then they ran off to Ethiopia and they tried to start their own religion with it. Not what happened at all. What happened was they had the original knowledge. Let's take a look at, uh, you know, this here. I wonder where the star moved to the left like that. The Star of David. This is really important stuff right now. So for me, this is another key piece of evidence. Right now, you know that uh, standard regular Jewish people, Ashkenazi and uh, Jews and so forth, uh, you know, they they have this, the Star of David. Uh, and what, where, what what's the origins of this? Now, this is from Encyclopedia Britannica. The Star of David is Hebrew Magen David, the Shield of David. Magen, also spelled Mogan, Jewish symbol composed of two overlaid equilateral triangles that form a six-pointed star. It appears on synagogues, Jewish tombstones, and the flag of the state of Israel. The symbol, which historically was not limited to use by Jews, originated in antiquity when side by side with the five-pointed star, it served as a magical sign or decoration. In the Middle Ages, of the, in the Middle Ages, the Star of David appeared with greater frequency among Jews, but did not assume any special religious significance. It is uh, found as well on some medieval cathedrals. The term Magen David, which is Jewish uh, liturgy, signifies God as a protector, shield of David, gained currency among medieval Jewish mystics who attached magical powers to King David's shield, just as an earlier uh, non-Jewish magical traditions had referred to the five-pointed star as the Seal of Solomon. So it actually dates back even before that. Kabbalists popularized the use of the symbol as a protection against evil spirits. The Jewish community of Prague was the first to use the Star of David as, a, as its official symbol. And from the 17th century on the six-pointed star, it became the official seal of many of the Jewish communities and a general sign of Judaism. Though it is not, has no biblical or Talmudic authority, the star was almost universally adopted by Jews in the 19th century as a striking, uh, simple emblem of Judaism in imitation of the cross of Christ, Christianity. So what they're saying here is that uh, they don't really understand where the star or origins of the star come from. They really don't have no clue about this thing, but they they liked it. And so because some leaders say this is a good thing to have, it'll scare off the evil spirits and it looks pretty cool, we'll take it. That's how they got the star. Now, let me tell you what really the star is really about and what the Ethiopian Jews knew it was about. The Ethiopian Jews say the star, the star of David is actually a Merkaba. Now, you see, this is where I know that these people have been around much longer and know the history much better. The star of David is a Merkaba. The star tetrahedron. The star tetrahedron is a crystalline field of information that is resonantly linked with each cell in the physical body in its inactive state. The star tetrahedron appears as a three-dimensional star of David 
composed of two opposing and interlocking tetrahedrons. They know that the, the, that the Star of David really is a star tetrahedron, which is a which are two uh, three-dimensional pyramids that can appear from the ethereal platform, multidimensional. Through meditation, you can actually uh, we have a we have a I have an actual song called Merkaba, where you it's a meditation track where you actually through a special type of guided meditation, you actually create your own Merkaba, and you get inside of it because it's a vehicle of ascension. You can actually travel inside the Merkaba in the spirit realm. They knew all about this. This is the real purpose and the meaning of it. It's not for decoration. It's not for putting on flags. It's not because it's cool. It doesn't have any. It's not because you think it has some cool magical powers because somebody said it had magical powers. No, 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 no. They knew about it. They knew that the Hebrew word Merkaba is actually composed of three words. Merkaba. Mer means light. Ka refers to the spirit. And Ba refers to the body. When you put these three words together, you get the notion of your body as the chariot or the vehicle for your spirit to ascend to the higher dimension or become divine light. In other words, it's the ascension process towards your light body. It goes, it goes way beyond simply being a better person and touches on the idea of becoming your true light self. This is the real meaning of the star. And when these people have this kind of knowledge, that means what they have supersedes what the other people know about the star because they actually think it's just a piece of jewelry to put around the neck, something to remember the flag of the country and things like that. Decoration. That's from Encyclopedia Britannica. That's not from Billy Carson. So if you want somebody to apologize, you go get you go after Encyclopedia Britannica. Don't come after me. Okay. The Merkaba symbol also refers to the healing energy and the effect of the divine union between male and female energy, meaning the union of self, the spirit and the body, and the self with the divine. So this is what they teach. This is their knowledge of the star, not the decoration knowledge. And that tells me between this and the fact that they don't have the Talmud, it tells me that they are, their knowledge is ancient. Their knowledge is super ancient okay it goes far beyond the others and they were isolated in that area for so long keeping that knowledge going from generation to generation to generation to generation and then when they stumbled upon these ethiopian jews and wondered well how come you guys don't have a talmud are you really jews well the talmud is brand new <laughs> In geological time scales, it just came up, it came to be. These people are ancient, man. That didn't even exist yet. Somebody wrote that later, after the uh, Exodus, after people migrated into, and they got isolated in that area in Africa. All right. So that's where that's where it went. Let's have a look at. Uh, let's have a look at something here. Let's see if we can pull up a quick video clip. This is a little couple of clips here. I got a couple of clips about the Ethiopian Jews and what they're trying to do to make their way in society. A lot of them want to end up back, want to get go to Israel. They want to go home is what they're calling it, going home. Um, but they're meeting a lot of problems because of racism. A small city in the north. This school teaches children about their Jewish faith, but also prepares them for a possible move to Israel. If they learn Hebrew and if they learn about their religion, it'll help. They'll create mutualism and integrate within the society there and support one another in all matters. You see, they're trying to get back. They desperately want to get back to Egypt, uh, to, to Israel. They desperately want to get back to Israel. Uh, they want to feel accepted in some way there you know everybody looked everybody's got their own journey they want to go on everybody's got their own journey but everybody's got their own internal thing that they're going through their own hero's journey or whatever you want to call it uh i can't knock them for that they want to go back to where they feel the origins came from of where how they learned this particular uh religion um you know but here's what they're running into they're running into severe problems with it check this out 
Beta Israel members want Israel to give them a visa to emigrate, but Sam and Gondor have been waiting more than 20 years. Ashenafi Asefa moved from the countryside to Gondor 12 years ago. Now he's one of the synagogue's religious leaders. 20 years they've been waiting, some of these people trying to get to Israel. <laughs> some people even more. They take over a few hundred at a time and give a few hundred people a little bit of chance to get over there every now and then. Um, but when they get there, they don't give them any type of assistance. A lot of them become homeless, very poor, suffering. Uh, there is somebody new that is working now in this area trying to fix this problem. Her name is Panina Tamo Shata. Okay, Panina Tamo Shata. She's actually uh, a Ethiopian, a black Ethiopian Jew. They're actually the first black Jew to ever make it onto the uh, into the government level, political level at is in Israel. So she's actually a member of the cabinet. First time ever this has happened. So this is actually a big, a big thing. And she's running into some issues there as well. She's trying to figure out how to overcome all the racism that's going on and how to get people over there. Let's check this out. I'm the first uh, black, first Ethiopia in origin person that born in Africa and become part of uh, the cabinet in Israel. And I have uh, a great mission and a, a lot of responsibility. As you mentioned, so many firsts for you, but the journey for you is still quite far for you and your community. Absolutely. We have a long road uh, still to do. Um, unfortunately, as you know, I think uh, every black person around the, the world know that we have a, a common struggle against racism and discrimination. And I started my activities in my early 20s uh, when I was a student, uh, a law student. And I believe that uh, we, we need to fight against discrimination based on color and other things. How will your new position help your community? We know that there is a lot of immigrants that wait to come back home to Israel. And we see that there is uh, uh, thousands of people uh, from my community, from Beta Israel, that waited in Ethiopia and they want to come to Israel. So it is one of my goals to bring them home. Okay, interesting guys. So you heard it there, directly from the horse's mouth. It's not Billy Carson making this stuff up. I'm giving you all the receipts, all the receipts that you need, you see? Every receipt that you actually need, I'm giving it to you so you can see exactly what's going on for yourself. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, man, you know, for whatever reason, man, we, we have it hard no matter where we are in the world. Uh, I mean, they just they just want to put the boot on the neck. Um, it's really unfortunate because this world can be such a much better place if everybody just learned how to love one another and just be happy with, with one another. Like I said in my other video the other day, I think it was a week ago, the thing about black people is we truly love everyone. We love everyone. We wanna, we want, we wanna be a part of everything. We wanna have fun with everyone. We love all races of people. We really are, are, are really loving, loving and fun, caring people. And to, in some ways it's been kind of our own, I guess, weakness because of being so loving and caring um, and happy and helpful, it's put us in a situation where we, we, we make ourselves a little fickle headed and vulnerable. And then we let other people take advantage of us uh, economically, physically, mentally, and it puts us in a bad place globally. And we, gotta, we have to find a way to rise above that. Those are just true facts. Like I said, guys, I'm not here to, I'm not here to pull your heartstrings. I'm here to tell you the truth and all the information that I can put, bring together uh, uh, to give you guys, uh, you know, some insight as to what's really going on. And yes, it's easy to keep blaming everybody out there saying, man, they're evil against us and they hate us. At the same time, we got to look at ourselves because there's a lot we can do to pull, pull, to pull ourselves together and get up off our butts too. You know, there's a lot we can do. We can, when you see somebody on their butt, we should be putting out a hand and pulling that person up. Instead, a lot of the times we take pleasure in uh, in their fall. 
And instead of helping them up, you know, you know that trick where you put your hand out and your kid, when the kid, your kid goes to slap your hand, you move it away. You know, remember that trick? That's kind of what we do. We have to get, we have to be better. We have to do better. We have to learn to be better. We have to learn how to help one another. We have to learn how to support one another better. We have to stop looking for excuses and reasons to down one another and look for re ways that we can mentor one another and help one another, okay, become better. It doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything everybody has say. It doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything I say. That's okay. That's okay. That's what makes you, you, and me, me, and everybody else them. At the same time, though, we have to find some kind of common ground that we can coexist and that we can become better loving with one another instead of focusing so much on going over the top to love everyone else we still have to do that but at the same time when we do that we just forget about ourselves i'm just being frank guys i'm being honest with you man i see it every day you remember i didn't i wasn't born with a silver spoon i came from the ghetto verifiable i came from underneath the ghetto i've had people in my chat they know where i'm from i came from the gutter man I came from the absolute gutter. Matter of fact, this weekend, I'm going to ride through the gutter. I'm going to ride through. Every now and then, I ride through. Every now and then, I ride through. You know why? To remind myself where not to end up and also to meditate and think, what can I do to find a way to reach out and help more people? You know? But yeah, it's a lot going on, man. A lot going on. But when I see this Merkaba information passed down by the Ethiopian Jews, and I see the the <laughs> then I see the Encyclopedia Britannica understanding of where what the uh, the Ashkenazi Jews and the other Jews believe in in terms of the Star of David and how they how they acquired it. That's when I recognize these people are ancient, man. These people got the real knowledge. All right, the young lady you just heard talking was Ethiopian Israeli minister. All right, she says we have a common struggle against racism. All right. This is uh, her Wikipedia page right here. She's the very first black woman, a very first black person at all to be um, to be put on the cabinet, uh, you know, which is really amazing in Israel. And her main focus is trying to get people out of jail that shouldn't be locked up. I think when she started, she said it was about 40 percent of the people that were in jail were black Jews. So you can see the racism. So it's the same duplication of what we have here going on in America. You know, uh, so she's been working to get that fixed. She's got a big job on her hands. Luckily, she's young. Looks like she's only born in 1981. So she should have some legs running, running up under her. She should be OK. But, you know, man, what a what a big job with it. What a big task to take on. So hats off to uh, hats off to Panina Tom Tamano Shata. Uh, she's got a hard job ahead of her. Big time. All right. Big time. Hard job ahead of her. All right. So. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, it's uh, the world is full of a lot of religions. And, you know, I don't understand why. That's just my personal thing. I just based on my, my real research, I don't I don't understand why people don't just seek spirituality. I think that spirituality is a true key to unlocking the freedom of the world and unlocking the freedom of humanity and giving us access to the true power that's inside of each and every one of us. I truly, truly believe that. Um, uh, thank you, Stephen Williams. Happy birthday again, man. And so I just, I truly believe that uh, every single one of us has a special power, a special piece of the puzzle that we can bring. But I personally believe that religion uh, puts that special power and that special gift that we have into a small little tiny box with a lock and a key. And it causes a lot of us to never really open that box because of fear, because the primary basis of religion is fear-based and anything that deals with fear is a low frequency and anything that's dealing with a low frequency is going to bring you back a lot of low low vibrations low vibration law of attraction i want high vibration law of attraction i want good things happen to me consistently i don't want to always have to hear about all these disasters i don't want to always have to worry about it. it's the end of the world and it's the end of days and all this other crazy stuff i don't want to hear about that stuff this end of days and end of the world um i just you know one thing Jews did get right is the fact that, uh, you know, Jesus was not the son of God. In my personal opinion, they got that right all around the world. All Jews, they got that one right. They got that one right. Uh, you know, then my, that's my personal opinion. You can take it. You can leave it. You can be happy. You can be sad. You can be glad. You can be mad. 
I believe Jesus existed and was one of 19 Christ that already existed. He's just one of them. And the Christ just has nothing to do with a particular person. It's a type of consciousness. Matter of fact, Jesus never said he was coming back. He said the Christ would return. He's talking about Christ consciousness in all of us. It's return of true gnosis, real knowledge, not of this um, remixed information that has been put out in these religious texts and books that keep people suppressed, oppressed, and chasing their own tail in a circle, in my personal opinion. I really do believe in humanity. I believe that we can do great things again. We did great things in the past and we will do them again. And I do truly believe that at one time in the future, at some point in the future, religion will fall away and true spirituality and true unconditional love for everyone will rise above all. I don't believe in I'm a God's chosen person. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in this. I'm, 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 you're, you're not God's chosen people. I'm God's chosen people. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. I don't, I think that's foolishness. I don't want to hear nothing about your chosen person by some uh, sky daddy with a magic wand. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear that. To me, that's no more division. That's more separation. That's more segregation. When you run around bragging about you're some kind of chosen person, but you're the best, you're chosen, but the other person around the corner uh, is no good. They're garbage because you're the chosen person. So many of the, these religions preach that mess, you know, Jehovah Witnesses, only 144,000 are going to go, are going to go to paradise. Well, if only 144,000 go to paradise, why in the world are you knocking on people's doors telling more people about it? Shouldn't you be keeping that a secret? <laughs> you know, you know, it just, you know, it just, it's just crazy. In the Bible, you know, the Christians believe that they're the chosen ones. And everyone else is an infidel and they're going to burn in a lake of fire forever and ever. They're the special people. You know, it's always this, we're this and we're that. It's more ego, it's more beating on the chest, and it's just more separation. How about, hey, we're all one. I love you. You love me. Like Barney, you know, the, the TV show. <laughs> I love you. You love me. How about, how can we, how can I help you, brother or sister? How can I, how can you, how can we be a help to others? How can we link up and make this happen for this group of people and help them out and take care of them? How can we be of service to others? How can, what about that? Let's forget about all this. I'm the best one. And, and because my God's the best one, you know, my son's grandfather is a, 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 a preacher, a pastor. My son is obviously he doesn't he's not into that stuff. He he learned on his own. He read the Sumerian Tabs. He came to me when he was 14 years old. He said, Dad, you know what? I don't believe in Christianity anymore. I'm I'm more gonna go on the spiritual path. I said, What make what brings you to that? Because I don't force anything on my kids. He said, Well, I read the Sumerian tablets and now I just want to follow spirituality. I see that all that was copied, the Bible was copied from that stuff. He came to his own conclusion using his own mind. But he he, he was talking to his grandfather, who was a pastor about the fact that he saw Israeli troops shooting Palestinian kids playing soccer in the field. And the response from his pastors, his grandfather, who was a pastor, was, well, they deserve to die because they're worshiping the wrong God. You see what religion does to people? Do you see what religion does to people? It destroys you. It absolutely takes your brain and shreds it up like you put paper into a paper shredder. That's what it does to your brain. It convolutes your thinking process. It convolutes your logical thinking process. It takes away any source of logic whatsoever. It throws logic out of the window. And then what is it, and what is it in bed? Ignorance and fear. Two dangerous things that the human body should not be able to encapsulate. Those two things are deadly. And that's why when you look into the Bible and you look into the Old Testament, look into all the people that are getting murdered and killed in the name of God. A lot of that information is also in the Torah. Read it. I want you to just go and read it. Go read the book of Deuteronomy. Make that Give yourself that challenge to go at least do that. The book of Deuteronomy. Go read that. 
and then come back and sit down and meditate and analyze the thought process that goes behind all that killing and all that murdering. And then you'll come to a realization that you've been trapped in a psychosis your whole life. Break free of that, release that, and realize the only thing you need to do is have faith and belief in your own ability to love other people. Your faith and belief in your own ability to forgive yourself for wrongdoings. And when you come to that point, and the final stage of real ascension is when you realize that the voice inside of your head is not coming from some magic sky daddy. It's coming from your own consciousness. When that voice shifts from a random, deep, manly voice, which is what everybody's trying to hear, a man from higher dimensions that wears a robe and has a magic wand, when you realize that God is not a gender, there is no gender, there is no man God. That was installed by man to oppress women. Women just got the ability to walk into a church or a synagogue. They just got the ability to do that. And they still can't say too much. That's why it trips me out when I hear women tell won't he do it? You fell for the trap. You putting the boot on your own neck now. Boom. Put the boot on my neck. I want to put the boot back on my neck. I don't, I want to be oppressed. Won't he do it? Boot on your neck. That's what you're doing. When you begin to realize that the voice that you're hearing, when that voice changes from some deep man's spooky voice to your own voice, when that voice, I don't hear any outside chatter. You know what I hear? When I get the gnosis, when I get the knowledge, when I get the download, I only hear me. I only hear me. I don't hear, yes, my son, and I'm going to give you a word today. I don't hear that kind of stuff. I don't, you know what I hear? I hear my own voice. I hear my own voice. And when you start to hear your own voice, when you can recognize that it's you talking to yourself from a higher dimension because you are God and God is you, that's when you are now getting somewhere. Don't mean you made it, but now you're making some progress. But until you keep hearing some other person, which is most likely a man always talking to you, Mm. got a lot more work to do in this dimension. You might come back a few more times until you get it right. All right? Guys, anyway, I love you guys. This is meant to be a blessing to everyone. This information is meant to help everyone. This is meant to uplift you. It's meant to teach you a little something that you maybe didn't know, give you a different perspective on things. Uh, hopefully, you can take this information. You can analyze it, download it, digest it, discern it, research it. I gave you my sources in the very beginning. Pause that video in the very beginning and go down all them sources on your own. Go down the rabbit hole, start learning some things, all right? And uh, you'll find a lot of the same uh, concepts that I possibly came up with, or maybe you'll come up with some slightly different ones. It's up to you based on your, percep your, your perception, your perspective, and how you analyze and how you, how you perceive things, and how you see, you know, how you understand the words that you're reading. But I tell you one thing, when you become a researcher, it changes a lot of things because you start to ask questions. And you know who I ask questions to? People say, how do you come up with all this stuff? I start talking to myself. That's how I do it. I start talking to myself and asking myself questions. And then I wait for myself to tell me what to do. And myself comes back and it tells me, look for this, look for that, look for this. And then I start looking for those things. And boom, that's how it happens. I begin to talk to myself. So when you see me talking to myself, don't be alarmed. I'm getting expert advice. <laughs> hey, guys, I, I, I appreciate every single one of y'all. Thank you, Grand uh, Zero, uh, Grand Zeno, for the uh, donation. Appreciate you, <laughs> Barney. All right, anyway, love you guys. I'm going to run. I'll be back again very soon. Don't forget, this Saturday, we have uh, the... Uh, the cryptocurrency masterclass. You can register for that online. Matter of fact, let me drop the link in the chat real quick before I get out of here. To that, it's free. It doesn't cost you any money. If you want to learn about crypto, how crypto actually works, 
Uh, if you want to really understand what it is and how, how it functions and all that good stuff, I'm going to drop in the chat right now a free crypto class. All right? I'm typing it in here now. And it doesn't cost you any money. You can only watch it on Forbidden Knowledge TV. When you register, you'll get a link there to watch it there. If you don't have a subscription, you can get the free trial and still watch it for free. So there's no reason why you couldn't watch it for free. All right. And that'll be, I believe, on Saturday, uh, the 6th. All right. So check that out. Register ASAP because the class is filling up very quick. I think there's over 1,600 people already registered. Maybe about maybe 100 or 200 spots left, and that's it. And you'll get a link to watch it and everything else. And like I said, if you don't have a subscription to Forbidden Knowledge TV, get the free trial and then still watch it for free. All right. Doesn't cost you any money to gain the knowledge. If you like it, you keep the service. If you don't like it, you just cancel. That's it. Very simple. All right. Um, I can do a research. I can do a uh, Yes, that's great. Trent Davis says, can you do a, a how-to research masterclass? I will do that. That's a great idea, Trent Davis. Thank you for the suggestion. I will definitely do that because a lot of people don't know how to research. They don't know the technique. They don't know what questions to ask. They want to, but they just can't figure out what questions they should be asking themselves to go look for the information. I'm going to make that happen. That's a great suggestion. One of, that's a suggestion of the year right there. So I'll make that happen. All right. Anyway, guys, I'll catch y'all later. Thank you for hopping on. Love every single one of y'all. Share this video. All right. Peace.